بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلا طبتم وطابت الأرض التي فيها دفنتم سيدي فيا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيم صلوات بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أرض الأنبياء والمرسلين بعد خلاق أجمعين سيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا مولانا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى بيت طيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذين صفاهم الله أجمعين أما بعد فقال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وهو, وهو أشرف القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد my respected elders, brothers and sisters, Abajal, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. I'd like to start off by thanking you for having me for these past few days. I'm, I've been inspired by each and every one of you in here. Um, whenever I travel, like I said the first night, it's, as, it's, it's a lot of inspiration for me. I get to meet new people, people who share their stories with me, some share their life stories with me, some I connect with, some they connect with me. And to me, that's, that's the utmost beauty is human beings connecting with each other. I think it's very profound, especially people from different cultures and backgrounds and religions. That uh, really makes, makes my time. So thank you for having me. Salawat ala Muhammad wa The past couple of nights we've been discussing some different concepts. One concept we discussed was the difference in acceptance of religion and deeds. And the very idea that just because a person is not a Muslim does not mean that his actions may not be accepted. Rather, um, with regards to that, any person's actions, if they make them grow, that in itself is an acceptance of the human being. And we came to the conclusion that God does not accept or reject deeds. Rather, you as a human being, any deed that you do is for your own benefit or for your, for your lack of benefit there is. And the whole idea of the existence of mankind in itself is a, is a, a blessing in the sense that you and I were nothing at one point and we became something. And the, the concept of religion, interestingly, when we examine it, as much as a Muslim community we say that we are advanced, as much as we say that we wish we had control over the world and we wish that everybody would become a Muslim and the problems of the world would be solved just like that, in all reality we ask a question and we say, where is the Muslim political system? And where is the Muslim economic system? And where is the Muslim in the world today from all of the killing and the world hunger and the things that are happening? Now tonight we'd like to focus on the idea that what is the issue? What is the problem here? We've understood there's a problem. What is the problem? And what part of the problem needs to be tackled? And what's, how is this problem being tackled in the next 20 or 30 years? What will happen? Where will we be? Specifically the generation, the younger generation, where will we be in 20 or 30 years from the system of law which exists today? And in all actuality, in all actuality, um, there is a there is a understanding. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah 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 you, if that child wants to come and bring them in if they want to come and listen, I don't mind if they sit in here and even if they little cause a little bit of noise, it's okay. Let them come inside. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. There's there's an understanding today about the world that religion is in itself a system which gives solutions. And in all reality, when we examine it, religion does not give solutions. Rather, what it does is it's a tool for you to utilize solutions through. Islam as a religion, when it came down to specific individuals, these individuals took the religion and they were able to skyrocket and change the reality that was around them. Other individuals took the same religion and completely used it to close their understanding and to limit the capacity of growth that they have. Let me give you a brief example. Take a look at a person like Zakir Naik today. The religion of Islam in the hands of the Messenger of Allah Muhammad 
when it was given to him, he was able to take a, a group of people, a large group of people, and remove them from some sort of lack of understanding to a higher understanding of what life is meant to be about. He took a group of individuals who were never colonized by any Persian or Byzantine empire because they were so worthless and moved them to a greater reality. Take a look at a person. Now, the Quran in the, in the hand of the Messenger of Allah Muhammad took the Arabian society and advanced them to such a level where things like chemistry and mathematics became second-hand nature to them. They were able to progress morally, scientifically at many different levels. Take a look at a book like the Quran in the hands of a person like, for example, Zakir Nayak. It goes to show you that Islam is as open as the individual carrying Islam is. And the Qur'an is as helpful and as open as the individual carrying the Qur'an is. The Qur'an in the hands of Zakir Nayak today has caused disunity among people. And there's a religious war. My religion is better than your religion. And your religion is worse because of this. And my religion is greater than yours because of this. And we want the whole world to convert to become Muslims and everybody lives happily ever after. Which is really not what Islam brought down. Islam's message is completely different. Completely different. If anybody thinks the purpose of Islam is to convert people, you've got the wrong Islam for sure. For sure. Now, I think even if, 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 if Jibra'il himself came down to give the Quran to Zakir Naik, Jibra'il himself, he would not do much more with it than he already has. Because if the individual is closed, then the message that he receives is extremely closed. But if the individual is open and has got an open mind, then the religion that's given to him becomes an open reality. Now there's uses to this religion because what's inside of here is not closed, it's open. And that's what we're trying to get to. What we're trying to get to is an understanding where we stop saying that religion or Islam has a solution to all my problems. Once I have it, my problems should be removed. Islam and religion is a tool. How open are you to accept this tool for change? If it does not solve your problems, the problem is not with the, the, the issue is not with the religion, but how you view it. There are certain people who take the religion of Islam and change it and digress it because of how close they are, and they equate it to blowing themselves up in buildings because that's what gets them salvation. And that's a wrong vision of Islam. There are other people who have Islam and they sacrifice themselves for others. They, for example, help feed the poor. They, for example, go out in the middle of the night and help others. That's a vision of Islam. Religion is dependent on how open you are as a human being. If you are open and your heart is open to the reality and the truth, then the religion will do something. If not, then it's closed. But at times we bicker and fight and we make it seem as if there's this automatic system where once I believe or I recite the Shahada, that's it. I've been accepted into the group of holiness. And now whatever I do is within the boundary of holiness and that God all of a sudden blesses me and I become part of the Shia or the Muslims. In all reality, we are accepted as part of a great people. But we are as great as we make ourselves. We are as great as we act. We are as great as we let the religion affect us to make us good. We are not automatically great because there's a group better than the others. It actually kind of sounds like the Jewish perspective that there's a chosen group of people and if you're not part of the system, you're outside of it and we are better than you. There's an understanding there. What I'm saying is religion is meant to be where you take in the system and you are working actively to participate and change what's happening in society. Only then will the religion be open. Now, what's the... What's the, what's the ulterior world view? When we, when we look at the way that we've seen religion, we've almost seen it as an a, a automatic system of good and evil as we spoke yesterday. Just to recap on what we talked about, we came to a conclusion that God does not accept or reject deeds. Rather, when we do things as haram and halal, quote-unquote, such concepts of haram and halal don't exist. They exist within the realm of positive effect and negative effect. If something has a positive effect on me, it's halal. If something has a negative effect on me, it's haram. There's nobody keeping score and saying, well, you've done 10 good deeds and 5 bad deeds, hence because you've got more good deeds and bad deeds are going to hell or heaven. Rather, the system is put in place for you to actively think about what's right and what's wrong. You're not meant to be a drone. This draconic system whereby we work based on the halal and haram at points limits us because we don't become creative thinkers. I've got an issue in my hand, I've got a problem. And all of a sudden I'm like, well, I've got a problem. I can realize that there's an issue. I don't know what to do. I'm not willing to ask. Let me look into my system of haram and halal to see if it's okay or not okay. Before we even go back to our own self-intuition. My intuition tells me this is wrong. 
My intuition tells me there's something wrong with what's in front of me. Yes, at times I need external guidance to help me, which the Quran comes in as external guidance. But there's this automatic system of good and evil inside of me. Hence, you see, even atheists today can see good and evil. And atheists can tell you killing is bad, lying is bad, cheating is bad, stealing is bad. Why? Because we are not good because we have religion. We are good because God created us that way. There is an innate goodness and a humanity within us which is great, which is good. And we spoke about this yesterday. And at times there's, this, there's a vision and idea that, that we are good because we have chosen a path. But we are good because in reality we are good. As a society we are good human beings. What does that translate into? That translates into this idea and the question that it typically poses. If you as a human being follow certain rules, haram and halal, you might say, well how do I know whether I'm following them because religion tells me to or if I really genuinely believe in this? How do I know? Or how do I know that if, if religion was suspended, would I now accept these or reject them? The question that we pose is this. If you were to wake up tomorrow and somebody was to tell you that religion doesn't exist or Islam doesn't exist by chance, would you still accept the haram which you had accepted the day before when religion was alive or would you now reject all that? For example, if, somebody, if you were to wake up tomorrow and someone told you, well, you know, let me just tell you that religion doesn't exist. For example, would you say, oh great, now I can go to the club. <laughs> now I can drink alcohol, awesome. Now I can shoot heroin if I wanted to. I can do whatever I want, I feel free. If that's the mentality or the thought, then let me just tell you, you've been fooled into thinking that you don't do things because you can't. You actually can. If you wanted to, today you can get up and do something bad. Nobody's going to stop you. What stops you is your internal innate feeling that there's something wrong with this act and I can't approach it because it harms me. God's got nothing to do with it. At the end of the day, God's not going to say, well, you made me happy or you made my angels happy. No. At the end of the day, God's going to say, what did you do and how much did you grow? Because I gave you so much so you can grow. Now, what did you do with that potential? What's at risk is not God's happiness. What's at risk is my growth and your growth. That's what's important. But at times we, we, we fade away from that. What's important is what others think is important. And what we're saying here is we want to wake up tomorrow and realize there's no system. Would we accept what we have halal as halal? Would we accept what we have as haram as haram? Would we innately say, you know what, I still don't want to indulge in indecent in acts because I still think it's bad. It's immoral. It's wrong. That human being has transcended an authoritative system which tells them what's right and wrong and has become his own free thinker where he critically analyzes what's right and what's wrong. Because all of a sudden nobody's telling you what to do. There's this innate nature. Now, we said yesterday that from an age of, of being young, from the age of 5 to 15, you might have this idea where I'm going to tell the child what's right and wrong and they will grow. And that's fine. Specifically for younger children it works. But when a person becomes older, when they become 20, 25, 30, and the parents aren't all of a sudden over their heads and they go out to university, they need to now fend for themselves because I have to believe what I believe. Now all of a sudden I'm in this ocean and people are questioning me everywhere. And if I don't have this free thinking reality, when people pose questions to me, I won't be able to answer. Now that's an issue there. Let me kind of give an example. Simon Sinek is a, is a, is a uh, marketing psychologist and he talks about, he's got a quite interesting TED talk talking about something called the, the golden circle. And when he talks about the golden circle, he makes three different, three different circles. Just the human being lives by three main circles. The first circle that he lives by, which is the main outer circle, the biggest circle, is the circle of the what? The second inner circle is known as the circle of the how. And the most inner circle is known as the circle of the why. There are three main circles. And he says that the human beings who are most successful in their lives are the individuals who focus on the main middle circle, which is the circle of the why, and they spread out from there. They understand what's the purpose of the thing that's happening, and they spread out from there. So it's why, how, what. And it's interesting because companies, and he, he mentions this, his companies actually market to us this way. Now, take an example of a company like Apple. Many of us here have, have iPhones, iPads, I whatever. Um, there's a lot of these different gadgets that are out there. And, and the marketing scheme is extremely important. Apple will not come to you and say to you, we've got a $1,000 um, MacBook Pro, we'd like you to buy it. 
or we have a $700 iPad, we'd like you to buy it. No, their marketing scheme is very smart. Instead of doing that, they come to you and say to you, which they start with the circle of the why, we have a vision in changing the way communication works. That's their purpose. And they make you feel like, wow, I'm involved in this vision. What a vision to have. i got to spend $700 to get this vision. I really want this vision. After that vision is given to you, they'll say to you that we've created a new piece of technology which is called the iPad and the iPad mini or the iPhone 4, 4S, 5, 5S and probably going to continue till ever. Um, and then the final stage is the what? How are we going to give this to you? Well, it costs $700. Here it is. Here's the retina display. Here's how it works. Here's a communication. Here's this. Here's this detail and here's that detail. And you're like, wow, you gave me your vision. You told me what you have and now you want to sell it to me. I'll buy it. It's a smart marketing scheme versus them coming to you and say, hey, I've got a $1,000 uh, MacBook Pro. You got to buy this. Like, well, why do I have to buy it? What's the point? Why should I buy it? Religion should also be marketed in a very smart way. Instead of coming to our children and saying to them, you need to pray or you need to fast or you need to do this or you need to do that. There has to be an innate system of making them understand why because all of a sudden they don't, they don't know what's going on. I mean, I come to a child and I tell the child, you need to do things this way. And when the child asks me why, well, I, I kind of don't have an idea. It's good because God says it's good. That's, that's, that's a reason. It's good because the Quran says it's good. When they ask for further things, there's no answers given. There's got to be a deeper answer to the questions that are given. And that's the issue that we have at hand. Look at, look at a group of people. Look at a person for example, who was with the Messenger of Allah like Amr ibn Jamuh. Amr ibn Jamuh was a 70-year-old blind man who had two sons. Actually, sorry, three sons. When the messenger came and he started reciting Surah Al-Fatiha around his sons, his sons converted to Islam, but their father was still a kafir. I want to show you how people who are purpose-driven will sacrifice so much for what they believe in. People who aren't purpose-driven will throw away the towel in the first 5-10 minutes of the fight, immediately. Amin al-Jamuh was a, a, a man who worshipped uh, Lat and Uzzat, and he had a special statue he would worship which was called Manat. And his sons would come to him, they say, you know, Father, there's this new religion that we have, you know, Muhammad is a great man. And he would ask them, what did Muhammad, you know, what did he tell you guys? And they would start reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. They would come and recite, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm al-Din, Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka na'sta'een, Ihdina al-Sirat al-Mustaqeem, Sirat al-Ladheena al-Amta alayhim, Ghair al-Maghdubi alayhim, Wal al-Dhalim. Now he heard these lines, he was blindfolded. Like, I've never heard such poetry in Arabia before. Where is this coming from? Because that was the miracle of the time of the Quran, is that the poetry of the Quran was mesmerizing. People had never heard such a thing. So Amr ibn Jamuh scratches his head, he's very confused. Like, what's going on here? He goes in front of Manat. Now what they used to do in the Arabian culture, is when they would talk to the statue, they would kind of trick themselves. They'd put an oracle behind the statue, and the oracle would make noises and sounds, and they would talk to them as if the statue was talking to them. And uh, imagine how absurd that is. It's almost like telling your friend, hey, stand behind the statue, I'm going to talk to the statue, talk to me as if you're the statue, give me answers. It's a very absurd notion. So she's behind the statue, he's talking to Manat, he says, you know, Manat, I've, I've got to tell you, I've heard some poetry, you're my God and I love you and you're everything to me, but he, Muhammad's got some amazing poetry, can you give me an answer? He goes to sleep, he wakes up, the oracle isn't talking, he sleeps again, he wakes up, the oracle isn't talking, he gets really frustrated, he goes back to sleep. His sons then come in the middle of the night, what they do is they take the statue, Manat, they take Manat, they tie it to a dead dog. And they take the dead dog and Manat and they throw it in a well filled with human feces. They throw it inside of there. He wakes up in the morning and he's asking his sons, what happened to Manat? One of his sons says, I'll take you to where Manat is. He takes his father, this is to kind of get him to understand the point, that wake up, what you're worshipping is not real. So he takes his father to the well, he goes by the well, he, he holds his hand, he says to him, where is Manat? He says, Manat is down there. He says, what do you mean Manat is down there? He says, he's down there. He says, well, tell me what you see because I can't see it. He says, well, you know, he's, he's tied to a dead dog and he's in the middle of human feces and he's in the well. And he's like, he realizes that he, he, he walks away angry. He says, Manat, you've disappointed me. Why don't you protect itself? Why don't you protect yourself? Why don't you help me? And he realizes at that point, as a seven-year-old man, that my God, there's no purpose in this. This is an empty vessel. It's just a piece of wood. There's nothing there. 
There's no purpose behind it. There's nothing for me to really follow. And it brings up a question today that are the laws that we follow today as Muslims, are they statues of laws or are they purpose-driven laws which can make our lives better in the long run? That's the question which we have to ask. So he walks away and he realizes there's no purpose in what's happening here. And he was the first person, when the messenger, he goes to the messenger of Allah, he becomes a Muslim. In the battle of Badr, he was a blind man, the Prophet refused to let him fight. He comes back to the messenger of Allah crying, he says to him, Ya Muhammad, if you don't let me fight, then I will die in my sorrow. Let me die by your side. Let me die by your side. His sons let him go, he goes on the battlefield, and he's one of the first people to become a shaheed. When he became a vision-driven a, a vision driven person or, 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 or a human, that's when he realized there's some sort of purpose for me to live. His life changed in that position. And what's interesting to say here is that the system by which we live, and there's an important discussion that goes on today, specifically within the world of, 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 of the Hausa and the world of, of, of the scholars and scholarly articles which are passed by, by and forth, that the world that we live in today and the laws that we have are not laws which are meant to be simply given, but they are laws with a purpose behind them, laws which have some sort of meaning. And there's two sort of understanding to these laws. One side of the, of the equation says, this is one opinion, is that the Islamic law system and the laws that we have today which are in place, which are meant to follow, are laws which are to be followed from t 1400 years ago till this day. Meaning we've, all of us have heard the hadith, Halal Muhammad, Halalun ila yawmil qiyamah. Wa halal Muhammad, Halalun ila yawmil qiyamah. And this is a very prevalent worldview today that the laws of Islam which are given to us way back when are now to be accepted and the Quranic laws are to be given to us and accepted as they are and this is a very prevalent worldview it's quite an interesting worldview because it, it gives strength and solidarity to the religion of Islam that laws are not meant to be changed and, and, and sloppy around here and there there's another worldview which says this which is that the, that the laws within the system are meant to be relative where they are changed and worked based upon the society and the situations which arise around us. Let me kind of explain this deeper. If we look at the Holy Quran, there are verses known as as known as, as Nasikh and verses known as Al Mansukh, abrogated verses. There are verses in the Quran where Allah makes a command and then verses later he abrogates that command with another verse. Meaning, this law no longer applies because God abrogates it with another verse. You might ask yourself, if God abrogated the verse, what's the point of the verse to be in the Qur'an if it doesn't apply anymore? What's the point? Why does it exist? And some of us today come up with the idea that the reason God has abrogated verses in the Qur'an is to show us that what, what's holy is not the actual law, but what's holy is the principle behind the law. And some ulama come with this opinion. They say, take an example of a verse like, like the, the hand cutting verse. For example, that if a person steals, his head is to be cut. If a person's hand is to be cut, if they're a thief, then you cut, their, of course, not the hand, but it's actually the fingers, according to our uh, Imam Rabba alayhi salam. Some scholars come with concern and say that if the hand is to be cut, Imagine in 50 or 100 or 200 years, we are able to regrow limbs and a person's limb is to be regrown. A person, you cut his hand, his limb is to be regrown. Now if you cut the person's fingers off, you can regrow those fingers, those limbs are to be regrown. And the scholars ask and question, well what's the purpose of that law if it's there? Is it for retribution? He's got his hands back. Is it to stop people from stealing? He can steal again, he's got his fingers back. What's the purpose of the verse? Perhaps is it that if I use therapy and therapize the individual in the modern society which I live in today, would that work better than cutting the hand? Perhaps would that work? Would that maybe be a more feasible solution? Let's give another example. Take a look at, um, take a look at the way meat is processed today. We were discussing this, myself and, and one of the brothers here, uh, about the idea of, of meat being grown. Recently, about two or three months ago, they grew the first uh, petri dish beef patty. It wasn't grown from any, from, there, was, there was no animal involved. This was grown from a dish in a, lab, in a lab with different cells and it was grown. And this was grown without any animal use. There was no animal involved, it was grown from different cells.
Now the question that we ask here, is this halal or haram? Does the meat have to be killed in a specific way or not? The point that we're bringing up here is this, is that as time advances and society advances, the laws which we have in place, one opinion says the laws stay the same. Another opinion says, is it possible for the laws to move forward? Look at, for example, some of our marajah today, where they say that the moon does not have to be sighted by eye, but it can be sighted through a telescope, or there's relativism in that law. Some marajah will tell you that even beating a wife is not allowed in a country, or, or in, in general, it's not allowed. The way the Quran explains it, there's a much different explanation than actually beating the wife. But some marajah that do accept that will tell you relative to where you live, that's not allowed. Of course, there's a, much, there's a much different understanding. Something the wife beating verse actually means to hit. But according to the Quranic context, it means to walk away. The word dharaba in Arabic does not mean only to strike, but it means to walk away. Fadlibu fil arv, as the Quran says. Walk away from them, strike the ground and walk away from them. But there's an idea that should the law stay the same, or is it possible for the laws to move forward? As we see today within the, the world that we have, it's very possible for these laws to be, to be moving forward. Because it exists, relativism within laws exists. Years ago, the concept of smoking was halal. Because scientific research has not reached a level for it to change. Today, smoking, to many manager to start smoking is haram. Because we realize it has cancer, it's got negative effects. And the question rises, is where are we heading? To which part or which system are we heading? Is it okay to say that there are certain laws which can be changed and mended and there are certain laws which are to stay the same? And it's a, it's a discussion which is out there where the two viewpoints exist. But regardless of that, to say and keep in mind that the world is a changing world. The system that we have today is a changing system. As time moves on 30 or 40 years from now, things are changing drastically. Science is changing drastically. The way we see the world is changing completely drastically. Where are we from this changing world? How willing are we and how open are we to say? Now some might think this way. How is it possible to change the rules of the Quran? How is it possible to mend the laws of the Quran? How is it possible for us to change a law? And the question that we ask is, is the law meant to be this forever and ever in eternity? Or is the law meant to be what's the best way for you to deal in your situations? Because Islam is fluid, brothers and sisters. Islam is not a system given to a group of people and God says use this for the rest of your lives. Islam is meant to be a thinking process where you're always reaching the next best solution as time moves on and technology advances. That's Islam. Islam is a fluid fluid system, it's not a stagnating pool of water, it's a fluid stream, it's a moving raging river, and we are to be moving with this river to see a new understanding for tomorrow. That's Islam. And perhaps, perhaps if we are to say, to address the question of yesterday, why is it that the, the, the world has, has become stagnant? Why is it that Islam is not giving back to the world as we should be? Why is it that 80% of all scientific discoveries have been made in the past 50 years by Europe and America? And why aren't we part of the system? Is because how much are we telling our children become scientists? How much are we telling them get involved in the corporate world? How much are we telling them get involved in business? Get involved in the medical field? Get involved in all of the things which are shaping the world? At the end of the day, at the end of the day, as much as it's important to pray and fast, it's important to give back to humanity. It's very important to give back to humanity. The Messenger of Allah has a hadith where he says, the creator of the wheel has a special position for him in heaven. Because this person has helped society, the wheel has helped so many people in the world, that this person must get some sort of reward for that creation. A person like Thomas Edison who created the light bulb. Other individuals, people who are finding cures to so many different diseases. These individuals have a special place in society in the eyes of God. Not only in the eyes of God, but for their human progression. It's powerful for humanity. And hence we say perhaps the reason why we're not moving forward is because we're not interested in moving forward. But if we take a look at our world and say, if the world is moving and we are stagnant, what are we to do to move forward? How are we as a community, as a society, are we to move forward? It might be scary at first to move forward, but some will say that how many are human enough to accept and to say that moving forward is important? And to go past that, that breaking point is extremely important as well. What's beautiful about the Imams, and, and specifically, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam al-Baqir. Allahumma salli ala 
was they were never scared to be challenged. Take a look at Imam Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. He's got a quite a profound story. One day he was standing, and a man comes to him and says to him that, Oh Imam, I'm a creator. I create things. He says to him, How? He says, Well, I just want to let you know that I don't believe in your God and I create things just like you, just like your God does. He says, How do you do that? He says, Well, I take some soil and I, I, I take it out of the ground, I shake it, and I realize there's there's worms in there. So I've created worms. I can actually create things just like you. And Imam realizes that you know this is an absurdity. Let me kind of just go along with this guy to see because Imam Sadiq at that point was one of the leading innovators when it came to so many different sciences. So he says, let's talk about it. Take me to that place where you created the worms. And he says, I'm here. He says, okay, do it. So he grabbed a handful of soil, looked at the soil, shook it a little bit and realized there were worms. He says, here, there are the worms and he put them on the ground. And he says, I'm okay, as their creator, as the person creating them, can you move them from, from left to right. Can you tell them to go this way or that way? He says to him, you know, that's going to be really difficult. I, I won't be able to, unless I pinch them, I won't be able to move them. Mm -hmm. He says, that's fine. Can you, tell, can you tell me the weight of each one of these different worms? He says, no. He says, as their creator, you have to tell me their gender, like which one is male, which one is female. Can you give me some sort of understanding? He says, no, I can't. He says, then what kind of creator are you? You don't know their gender, you don't know their weights, and you can't even tell them which way to go. Realize here there is this logical flow where he didn't belittle him and say, Well, how stupid are you? I didn't want to talk to you about that. You can't create anything. He went with him. He sat with him. He talked to him. He logically deduced this very idea that you as a human being cannot create. There is a system of checks and balances where we are able to discuss and logically accept other opinions. Why is it at times that when another opinion is given, certain individuals don't like that? Or why is it at times that when somebody comes with an opinion, we will completely disregard it? The very school of Ahlul Bayt was open on this very basis of discussion. Let's talk back and forth. Let's, let's discuss things. It's beautiful because in the world of academia, it thrives in the very progression of science is there are theories and there are specific ideas where one theory is there. Another scientist will come and say, I don't believe in this. He will do research and do research and over and over and over again consistently do research until he proves it wrong and a new theory happens. Another scientist will come, research this theory, look on it over and over and over again, prove it wrong, another theory will be built. And there is a constant building of higher and higher, higher realities. Islam is a system of tools, of thinking which was given to us that we may find the best solutions to our society, to our drug problems, to our teenage problems of bullying and killing to our issues which we have of, of pornography and, and sexual indecency, all the issues that society has, you and I are meant to bring up solutions for these societies. If we don't come forward and speak about them, we will never get these solutions. And that's why the, the beauty of Imam Hussein, if you look at the beauty of the Imam, is that he stood against a great form of oppression which was so powerful and dominant that you'd have to be a fool to stand against it, but he did. He said, I don't care how many there are in front of me. I don't care how many thousands there are. If I can make a change and stand up and the 72 with me, if they die, it doesn't matter. I've made a stance. I've done what I have to do. My wajib in front of Allah is done. I've come up and stood against oppression. And that's the beauty. It's a message to us. We have to stand forward. We have to come up as, as leaders and say, what are the solutions for the issues of our society? And what breaks the heart that Imam Hussein alayhi salam, not only does he stand, but he becomes the last one standing. And not only does he make a powerful stand, and he's the last one standing, but if you look at the world today, he was the last one standing on the battlefield, and he's the last one standing today. Because no one is more alive than Aba Abdullah. Can you tell me Yazid is as alive as Imam Hussein? Do we even know where his grave is? Do we even know where the graves of the oppressors of Imam Hussein are? Look at the grave of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. Millions yearly follow him. Last year in December when I went to Iraq, there were people who were so poor, so poor, they had very little. They would spend their whole life savings. One man looks at me and says to me that my whole life savings have been spent on this mokib just so that I can give to the zuwar of Aba Abdullah. Just so that I can give to the zuwar of Aba Abdullah. What a powerful man. And what a stance he made. Remember there was, there was a young boy who was, who was sweeping on the floor and I walked by and his father had so much food. And he came to me and, and he grabbed, he hugged me by the leg and said, you have to come eat. I said, no, I can't because I'm walking. And he started to tear. He says, no, you have to come eat. We made the food for you. You must come eat. 
And I looked at him as a young, young child, maybe 10 years old, who taught him this? What kind of feeling does he have for Imam Hussain? Who is the Imam to him? What has his father taught him about Imam Hussain? See, it takes one man to stand and say, there's an issue in society. I have to stand up and say something. And he motivated millions in a country which is ravaged by war. Ravaged by, by, by a lack of electricity, a lack of water, a lack of security. People are dying every day. For people to have such warm hearts and to give in the name of Abba Abdullah is a big step. Go to any world lavish country, you'll find that people are greedy to themselves because there's not much to give. But we see the opposite. We see people giving and giving and giving in the name of Imam Hussein. What's this giving for? What's the movement about? Let's connect it to today. Let's say there's issues in today's society which we need to connect to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And it's sad to say that as a man who stood alone in the battlefield, who was courageous, what breaks the heart is the call towards his sister, Lady Zainab alayhi salam. As Imam Hussein alayhi salam was standing on the battlefield, he looks towards the tents and he starts saying in the loudest of voice, Alahel min nasirin yansurna Alahel min mu'inin yu'inuna Alahel min da'abbin yadubbu anna He was saying, is there no helper to come and help me today? Is there no warrior to come and stand by me? He started looking at the bodies of his companions on the floor he walked by their bodies and he would say, Ya Abis, Ya Habib. O oh, Abis, O oh, Habib, where are you? Ya Muslim ibn Awsaja, where are you? Ya Abbas ibn Ali, wa Ya Ali al-Akbar, wa Ya Qasim, where are you from helping you, your family, Hussein? But Imam did not realize, as he realized that Abbas السلام, was on the river of Al Farad. Perhaps what broke the back of Imam Hussein السلام, was the valiance of Al Abbas. السلام. On that day, Al Abbas walks by the tents and hears the young children crying, Al Atash, Al Atash, thirst has killed us. He hears the cries of the children, he goes to Abba Abdullah, he says to him, Brother Hussein, the children are crying for water. I want to go out to bring them water. Imam Hussein says to him, Abbas, if you go, then my army will break you on my backbone, Ya Abbas. He says to him, but if you must go, then bring water for the children. Al Abbas rides and goes towards the river of Al Farad. There were enemies which were there on the river. He removed them from the river and his horse got into the water and he jumps off off his horse. He gets into the water and he grabs a handful of water and brings it closer to his mouth. And he realizes that how can I drink when my brother Hussein is thirsty? How can I bring the water into my mouth when Abba Abdullah is still very thirsty? He takes the water container and he fills it with water and he gets on his horse and he rides towards the tents. Umar ibn Sa'd yells and says, If Hussein gets one drop of water, then the army will not be safe from him. Cut any size of water from Al Abbas and do not let him get back to the tents. They come, one man comes from the right side and hides behind the tree. He strikes the right hand of Al Abbas and it falls. One man hides behind another tree and he strikes the left hand of Al Abbas and it falls. Al Abbas now takes the water container and holds it by his mouth as he is on his horse arrows come at him as if they are rain and arrow strikes the water container and the water falls out another arrow strikes the eye of Abu al-Fadl Abbas here he stops and he realizes he has no hands to fend off the enemies and there is no water to take back to Sukaina and Zainab. Who will he go back to see? As he is standing there, a man comes from behind and strikes.
strikes him with a bow and he falls on the ground. And he yells, Brother Hussein, come to me. Abba Abdullah comes towards him. And Abbas is on the ground. Blood has covered his eyes. He cannot see a single thing. He hears footsteps coming closer to him. He says, Whoever it may be, please do not kill me. Wait for my brother Hussein to come. I want to say farewell to my brother Abba Abdullah. Imam Hussein comes by him. He takes his head and he puts it in his lap and he wipes the blood from his head. He says to him, Brother Abbas, I am your brother Hussein by your side. Al Abbas takes his head and he puts it on the ground. Al Hussein takes the head of Al Abbas and puts it on his lap. Again, Al Abbas takes his head and puts it on the ground. Hussein says to him, Brother Abbas, why is it that every time I put your head in my lap, you put it back on the ground? He says to him, Brother Hussein, at this moment my head is in your lap, but when you fall and you die, in whose, in whose lap will your head be, Ya Abba Abdullah? As he is talking to him, the soul of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas leaves his body. Al-Hussein goes back to the tents and he is saying, Al-An in Kasar Dahri, Al-An Qallat Hilati. The first person that meets Abu Abdullah is Sukaina. She says, Father Hussein, you have come back without our uncle Al-Abbas. Where is he? Al Hussein doesn't speak to her, he goes to the tent. And when he goes to the tent of Al Abbas, he brings down the pole, indicating that O Sukain and O Zainab, Al Abbas is no longer with us. Zainab on that day, after Abba Abdullah has killed, Shemar tells Zainab to get on the camel. She's standing next to her sister, Um Kulthum. Um Kulthum looks at Zainab. She says to her sister, why don't you write first? I will help you. Zainab looks at Um Kulthum and says, Sister, if you help me ride, then who will help you ride? Zainab says to her, I will look towards the one who is on the river who has brought me towards Karbala. And she looks towards the river and she recites these lines of poetry and she says, Ya Abbas, man talli jibitni. خايا وبيدك كرك بتني بس ما رحت علي وقفتني إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسألم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين يا الله Let's raise our hands towards dua. This is the last night. Allah inshallah may accept our dua There are many people who are oppressed around the world Muslim and non-Muslim individuals Who are seeing so much oppression around the world In all parts of the world Let's raise our hand to recite Amani Jubu five times together Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Aman Yujibu Al-Mudhtar Ida Da'a Wa Yakshif Al-Su Aman Yujibu المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا Oh Allah, we ask you to make us sinners in our communities, Ya Allah. Our brothers and sisters around the world, protect them, Ya Allah. We are the Muslims and